Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man sitting in a tin can far above the world. Ladies and gents, the captain. I thought you were going to say farting above the world. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. And thank you, Cleveland Browns. This week, we are very happy to be featuring Maniacal Double IPA by the good folks over at Port City Brewing in beautiful Alexandria, Virginia. Cheers to Dave and the Port City team for sending us this fantastic beer. This is a double IPA, so it's strong. That's because they use about five pounds of hops per barrel, and Maniacal is dry hopped with cashmere, citrus, and El Dorado using Port City's secret weapon, the Hopzooka. Garage grade, let's give this a wild four and a half bottle caps out of five. And let's give some cheers to our friends. First up, a big cheers to friend and fellow bourbon lover, Sarah Hilliard in Kentucky. And a big shout out to Kimberly in Denton, Texas. Next up, we have a cheers to our friend Jennifer in Puyallup, Washington. And a nice jib goes out to Stephanie in Boulder, Colorado. We received a wonderful letter telling us that our little garage show really helped out some good people get through a very difficult time. And I just want to remind everyone that no matter how difficult things get or the differences between us, we are all going through this little thing together that we call life. And that's why we say be good and be kind. So a big shout out to Carrie D and her amazing and resilient daughter, Lauren in Kansas City. Cheers to you both and cheers to everyone who contributed to this week's Garage Beer Fund. Yeah, everybody say it with me. B double E double R U N beer run for all of our old episodes check those out on the stitcher app and also check out our show off the record on stitcher premium you can also find a link at our website truecrimegarage.com and while you're there make sure you sign up on our mailing list so you know about our promo codes for the store page and that is enough of the business all right everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime County men missing for nearly a decade, and tonight a detective pinpoints his former colleague, saying he's still a person of interest in this unsolved case. And that's not all. Our Amanda Hall talked to one mom who still has no answers about what happened to her only son. Amanda. That's right. Detective O'Neill with the Major Crimes Unit has been on both of these cases for most of those eight years. He tells me he's been all the way to Canada chasing leads, but that all of the real corroborated evidence leads right back here to Collier County. Still wakes me up in the middle of the night, mm-hmm. and my mind is just racing constantly, thinking about, you know, has the sheriff's department did everything that they were supposed to do? It's been eight years since Marcia Williams spoke with her son Terrence. Eight years his four children have been without a father. And though the oldest two are teenagers now, they don't speculate about what happened to Terrence. The truth was told to them in the beginning. What is that? Um that he was last seen with the deputy from Collier County, and he disappeared. Terrence Williams was last seen near North Naples Cemetery on January 12, 2004, by Corporal Steve Calkins, who said he gave Williams a ride to a convenience store. I hope everyone was paying attention and listening closely during this week's trailer because that was a great summary of this week's cases. That's right, cases, because as you heard in the trailer, we have two missing 
persons. But these two missing persons cases are much different than the case we covered last week. In fact, these two cases are much different than any other missing persons cases covered here before. For starters, last week's case, Logan Schindelman, that case is truly a mystery because unfortunately, just like Brandon Swanson and Brandon Lawson, Logan's disappearance is a story where the leads are mysterious. So much so that the leads may not be leads at all or could have nothing to do with his case or why he is still missing. This week's cases, Captain, have a potentially big lead and share a commonality that not only link the two cases, but the possibility that the reason that these two individuals are still missing as of January 2021 is that just maybe someone is responsible for for the two missing men. Both of these cases and the men we are looking for are Felipe Santos and Terrence Williams. Both of these cases are classified as missing endangered and law enforcement speak endangered is a classification upgrade from simply missing when it's more than reasonable to infer that the missing individual or in this case individuals are missing because of foul play is involved. I think these cases are going to make people look at other missing person cases a lot differently. But here we have two missing males and both law enforcement believed to be endangered. Again, the names of those two, Felipe Santos and Terrence Williams. Now, these two individuals did not vanish together. In fact, there is zero evidence that the two men even knew one another. But these cases are unless we find some reason to tell us otherwise, will forever be linked together because first we have Felipe Santos who goes missing and other than his close friends and relatives, there was not a whole heck of a lot of activity as far as actually looking for this guy or any type of investigation is concerned until later when Terrence Williams goes missing. And then both cases become very active. Now, we are not the first, obviously, to tell this story. But because Terrence's disappearance really kicked off the major investigation, often the details surrounding his disappearance are told first. But here, Captain, in this garage, we will start at the beginning as to not make things any more confusing than they already are. Felipe Santos, his last known whereabouts were from October 14th, 2003 when he was known to be alive and well in Naples, Florida. My research found that Felipe has two birth dates listed with different agencies assisting in the search for him. As of this recording, Felipe would be 40 or 42 years of age, depending on which agency is reporting. Felipe is a Hispanic male, and at the time of his disappearance, October of 2003, he was in his early 20s. There is a listed birthday of January 1st, 1979, and some agencies give his date of birth as May 26th, 1980. And a good description at the time Felipe went missing is as follows. Felipe's height and weight are listed at 5 foot 7 inches, 150 pounds. The Charlie Project lists Felipe as a Hispanic male with black hair and brown eyes. Santos wore his hair in a ponytail at the time of his disappearance. He is a Mexican citizen and speaks Spanish and very limited English. As for clothing, Felipe was wearing what is described as a t-shirt, blue jeans, and boots on that day. Now, the details of this disappearance, as said, Felipe Santos was last seen in Naples, Florida on October 14th, 2003. A lot of the reports out there, Captain, a lot of the online reports list him as going missing on October 1st right. of 2003, which is just incorrect. If you do a little digging, if you go to the Collier County Sheriff's Office website, they clearly state that he was last seen on the 14th, and they have police reports and other records to back up that date. Right. So just so I'm clear, you're saying that he's a citizen of Mexico. He's not a citizen of United States. Correct. He would be an undocumented worker at the time of his disappearance. 
He was driving to work with two of his brothers. Felipe is driving a white 1988 Ford truck. At 6.30 a.m., Felipe's vehicle hit another vehicle near the Green Tree Shopping Center at Airport Pulling Road and Immokalee Road. This is a busy area. In the immediate area, we have a lot of storefronts, fast food restaurants, gas stations, and behind most of those storefronts and businesses, there are neighborhoods and condo communities. Right. People in the area would tell you that Immokalee Road is a busy road even at 6.30 a.m. on a Tuesday. So we have this vehicle accident. No one is hurt in the accident, and the damage to both vehicles is rather minor. Mm -hmm. A Collier County Sheriff's Deputy, Corporal Stephen Henry Calkins, arrived at the scene. Now, there are three persons in Felipe's vehicle, including himself, and he is straight with the officer and tells Corporal Calkins he's the one driving And he doesn't have a license or Mm -hmm. insurance on the vehicle. Neither of his brothers would have a license or insurance on the vehicle as well. Right. Felipe Santos is the at-fault driver in this vehicle accident situation. The sheriff's deputy, Stephen Calkins, cites Felipe Santos for reckless driving and for driving without a license or insurance. Now... There will be plenty of witnesses to much of what is happening, right? As we already established, this is a busy area. This is a well-lit area, even though it would be, you know, rather dark at this time. So we will have plenty of passerbyers, and at the very least, we will have Felipe's two brothers that were traveling with him that morning, Mm -hmm. and we have the driver of the other vehicle. So we have witnesses as to what's going on. Now, the driver of the other vehicle says that when Officer Calkins arrived on the scene, he seemed agitated right from the get-go. Yeah, some people were mad to have to do their their job. I love those people. Yeah. The people that grunt and sigh and make make noises when you ask them to do the job that you're paying them for. Yeah, my favorite is when you're in line and somebody goes, next, next, (laughs) and you just know they don't want to be here. So what we have here is a very differing in opinions. We have Calkins who says that he did not arrest Santos. However, we have all three witnesses, Mm -hmm. his two brothers and the other driver. Do we know anything about the other driver? We do. Um, I know that her name is on record somewhere. Um, We don't want to give her name, but I'm just saying... I'm assuming that she's a legal citizen. That is correct. That is correct. And and she has been interviewed multiple times. Now, what we have here, though, is we have all three of these witnesses that would later say that they all just assumed that Felipe Santos was under arrest by the officer because they all witnessed Officer Calkins put Santos in the back of his patrol car, and then the patrol car drives off. And did they say that he was handcuffed? Um, no, I don't believe that that is in the reports. Right. But we could assume. He may have been. Um, there's also a chance with this being, these are rather minor infractions. Mm-hmm. I mean, him being here undocumented could lead to him being deported, but these are not violent offenses. I don't see much of a reason to slap some cuffs on this guy, if especially if it seems like he's cooperating. You know, he is at least honest and forthcoming with, hey, I don't have a license and I don't have insurance on this vehicle. But you can't let him drive away if you're the officer. You know he doesn't have a license. You can't let him drive away. So basically what you're telling me is this officer arrests him, puts him in the back of the car, leaves. Who drives the vehicle away? Or did they have it towed? From my understanding, the vehicle was not towed and the officer did not request a tow because he said that it was not in the way of traffic. (laughs) Right. But you can't let one of the brothers just drive the car because you know they have no license. Oh, but see what you are stating here, Captain, are all things that make a whole lot of sense. Well, I like to show up and do my job. 
Well, what we're going to see here is a lot of officers, Officer Calkins' actions and what he will say he's doing. It doesn't really add up. It right. doesn't track if you if you try to reason with it and make sense of his actions. Because what he says is, look, Santos, I changed my mind. He was nice. He was polite. And so I decided not to arrest him, not to drive him to the jail. Instead, mm -hmm. I drove him to a Circle K gas station because I didn't want him driving the truck off. But right. again, as you already pointed out, that makes zero sense because you are fully aware at this time as the officer that the other two individuals in the truck they did not possess a, a legal driver's license either. And you just left them there. And what do you do if you're them? You're left. You don't know what to do with the car. Are you going to call somebody to ha have them come pick you up? No, you probably have to get to a job site or you're going to lose your job. So one of them probably jumped in the driver's seat and drove both of them to work. So these are, let's, let's track this and, and how it's going to really become known that something fishy is going yeah, on. Yeah. But hold on a second. When have you ever heard of a police officer, any law enforcement driving somebody to jail and just decide, you know, what? changed my mind, changed my mind. I'll just drop you off at this gas station. You know what, though? I play it out in my mind a thousand times because you and I are nice guys. I can envision if if we were the officer, you know, you're chatting up the guy, chatting up the perp a little bit. And at some point you look back and you go, you know what, son? I like the cut of your jib. You need I'm, a break. This guy needs a break. I'm going to let you out. Yeah, but you don't let him out. You <laughs> take him to the police station and you say, call somebody from here. I'm not going to arrest you. I'm not going to book you. But... Once you take um, ownership, I guess, of that individual, it's your job to make sure that they are safe. Right. He's he's officially, regardless of how Calkins wants to spin it later, mm -hmm. if this dude's in the back of your car, he's in your custody. Right. And you are then a steward of him. You are responsible for him. Right. So what's safer, having him get a ride from the police department or dropping them off at the Circle K. Well, let's let's go through this because right. there's some details that we we need to get to. So, how this all comes about, or at least how everyone becomes aware of this rather quickly, of potentially this young man having gone missing, is that later that same day, Santos's boss contacted the local jail because he wanted to bail him out. Hey, I need my worker back, right? Right. So this is a nice boss going to bail out this young man so he can get back to work the next day. Well, and he doesn't speak a lot of English, but he might be like the contact person. You know what I mean? Like where where he's able to communicate with the other workers for his boss. So the boss man finds out that Felipe Santos was never booked at the jail. Okay. And we've kind of circled around this a little bit, but let's go through it in, in detail. This is because Officer Calkins never took Santos to jail. When questioned... Well, this is what he's claiming. Officer Calkins says he changed his mind about taking Santos to jail, saying he found Santos to be a polite and nice young man. So instead, Calkins drove Santos to a Circle K convenience store slash gas station. This would be about one mile away from the site of the accident. Calkins says, one... He didn't have Santos's vehicle towed away from the scene because it was not obstructing traffic. Calkins says he took Santos somewhere that Santos could call someone and he could get a ride from a licensed driver there. He didn't want to leave Santos with the vehicle, fearing that Santos would get back in the truck and drive off. So Officer Calkins, according to his statements, took Felipe Santos to the Circle K and drops him off there. Calkins says he last saw Santos walking toward the payphones at the Circle K. Again, he's your responsibility. You don't just leave him walking towards the payphone. And this is a mile from the wreckage. It's roughly, he says roughly a mile. It's actually fairly close. If you look at it on a map, it's, it's pretty close. I mean, I don't want to, can I start poking holes in his dumb story? Or do you have more to go? No, go ahead. 
Well, first of all, if you're concerned that he's going to get back in his truck, you might want to drop him off somewhere farther than a mile. It'll take him less than 15 minutes to walk back and jump in his truck and go. Correct. Right? And you don't even sit there and wait for him to call somebody or to wait to make sure that he gets a ride. It, it just doesn't make any sense. And on top of that, okay, I understand not towing the vehicle. It's not in the way. It's not damaged. Somebody could drive it off. But you left two other illegal immigrants with no driver's license by the truck. Correct. So who do you think is going to drive the truck? Um, it's, It just doesn't make a lot of sense. No, it makes it makes zero sense at all. What would make the most sense is he decided to arrest the guy and take him to jail, and Santos should have arrived at the jail at some point. That's what would make the most sense. Yeah, again, even if you changed your mind on arresting him and you wanted to give him a break. You didn't even make it a, a mile away with the guy. He must have been really nice and polite in a very short period of time Yeah, <laughs> to convince you to let him Especially go. Especially a guy that we know doesn't speak English that well. No. He, so Felipe Santos has never been heard from again since this incident right here. After his disappearance, his brother filed a complaint against Calkins with the sheriff's office, but Calkins was cleared of any wrongdoing. I do want to point out, Captain, that this was over the course of a couple of months. He wasn't cleared, I believe, until early January of 2004 of any wrongdoing. There's a lot of reasons why Calkins should be cleared, and I can see why he would be cleared in any wrongdoing in this particular case. Now, we're going to get into some things that are not very nice and don't put Officer Calkins in a very nice light here and i don't think he's going to have any friends any garage friends by the time we're done with these two episodes mm -hmm. but but we don't have any garage friends we need to look at this one we're going to stay water here and we also need to look at the actions of the collier county sheriff's office well okay my other question is this is a busy road so we should have eyewitnesses at the gas station at the circle k possibly some video footage from businesses in that area that would be able to back up his story. Yeah, this is a busy road. This is a busy area. That Circle K would be busy. I'm, I'm very familiar with this area. This is an area that I travel to annually, and these roads are always busy, especially in the morning hours. And in the morning hours, you see a lot of workers. Keep in mind, this is Florida. It gets very hot there. And so what we have going on is a lot of these uh, people that might be laborers or have very physical jobs, they want to get an early start. You right. want to start before early it because, yeah. before it gets way too hot. These guys, these brothers were in uh, concrete and masonry work. Yeah, that's so tough work. That's tough work, especially when it gets to be 80, 90 degrees out. And what you will see in this area typically is, uh, you will see a lot of construction guys, a lot of landscapers and such that, that are up and you see the trucks moving on these busy roads early in the morning, six, 7 AM getting ready to get that early jump, get the, get a good work in on that day. Now I was kind of circling around the sheriff's office. One thing that we have to keep in mind here is they did clear Calkins of any wrongdoing in Santos's case. This is initially, they're going to go back on this later, but initially they clear him of any wrongdoing. And I think you, you can see why, as I lay this out here for you, Captain, as we said earlier, Felipe Santos is a Mexican national at the time of his disappearance. He's living in Florida illegally. It looks like he had been living there for about three years at the time of his disappearance. We said he was on his way into work before the traffic accident. He was employed with a concrete company. He was sending money back to his family in Mexico. I've seen different reports here. Some reports state that he was married. Some state that he had a girlfriend. Some state that um, he had both. <laughs> <laughs> some state that the girlfriend lived here or his girlfriend or wife still lived in Mexico Regardless of whom was living where, what we can say for certain is all reports indicate that he had some family here in Florida 
and some family still in Mexico, and he was sending money back to the family in Mexico from time to time. Now, the reason why you're going to clear Calkins of any wrongdoing is a warrant goes out for the arrest of Felipe Santos. Mm -hmm. Okay, because this is the next month in November of 2003, a warrant was issued for Santos after he failed to appear in court for a hearing regarding the traffic accident of the day that he vanished. Mm -hmm. Now, at that time, in late 2003, investigators believed that Santos probably returned to Mexico or was in hiding to avoid the charges he was facing or avoid being deported. Right. So reasonable explanation as to believe why we cannot find this dude. Now, that's all going to become a big problem for Officer Calkins in January of 2004. Cheers, mates. Cheers to all the true crime addicts. Cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers there, Captain. This brings us to our second case. This is the missing persons case of Terrence Williams. And the details of this case are as follows. On Sunday, January 11th, before he went to bed, Jason Gonzalez, this is Terrence Williams' roommate, says that he spoke to Terrence on the phone on that evening. A little background on Terrence Williams. He grew up in Tennessee before moving to Naples, Florida to be closer to his mother. He has a roommate. This is Jason Gonzalez. And at the time, Terrence Williams is working two jobs. During the day, he works as a construction worker. And in the evening, he works at a local Pizza Hut restaurant. He's working two jobs because he has four children and he has to pay a lot of child support. He's working at a little Caesar pizza hut. (laughs) Right, right. Now on this night, on this Sunday night, Terrence Williams is invited to go to an after work party with a bunch of the pizza hut employees and coworkers. He does not have an active or valid driver's license at this time. What's with all these people that don't have driver's license driving around? Well, if you're an undocumented uh, worker, somebody that's not supposed to be here legally, you can't just walk in and and get a driver's license. Now, Terrence, he is a different situation. His license has been revoked from a DUI. Okay, so he recently purchased a white Cadillac. Now, this is one of those big old school White Cadillacs. I believe it was a 1983. Prime year. Right. It was a prime year for the Cadillac. Well, he purchased the vehicle because at some point and fairly soon, he's going to get his license back. Okay. Right? So he will be legally driving, but not on this day. And that's why he's calling his roommate. He's saying, hey, I was invited to go to this after work party. Why don't you go with me? You can be the driver. Right. You know, you you take your vehicle, I'll ride shotgun, we'll go have a good time at this party. The roommate says, I don't want to go. Right. So against better judgment, Terrence decides he's just going to drive his vehicle and go to this party. Well, we can all agree this is a bad decision, but it's also, there's some evidence of him making bad decisions. He obviously got a DUI. He obviously was drunk at some point and decided to drive his car. Williams is not like a what I would call a bad guy, but he's no. no he's no saint either. He's he's done some he's had some infractions. Yeah, good people make bad decisions from time to time. 
on this day, he decides to drive. Now, as far as all witnesses are concerned, Terrence left this party sometime around 6 a.m. the following day. So this would now be Monday, January 12th. At the time, he is 27 years old, and he's coming up on his 28th birthday relatively soon. At some point, he is pulled over or he's involved with this officer Calkins again. And it's a little, it's a little confusing as to why, because what we're going to have is Calkins statement of why the two were interacting with each other. Officer Calkins says that at some point on the 12th, he witnesses a Cadillac who is, it appears that they're having some kind of mechanical trouble with the vehicle. He says he asked the driver if everything's okay. The driver tells him that he's having trouble with the engine. And that's when they start interacting with one another. Right. What goes on from here is somewhat similar to what we saw in the Santos case where Williams is eventually put into Calkins vehicle and then they drive off. There's some problems with this whole story. And we're going to kind of back into it here, Captain. So what happens is we have Terrence Williams' family. They call police and they filed a missing persons report. This is because at some point on the 13th, the roommate, Jason Gonzalez, he reaches out to Williams' mother and says, Hey, my roommate, your son, went to this party the other night. I've not seen him since. I spoke with some of the people that he worked with. They say he left at 6 a.m. on the 12th. Now it's the 13th. This dude's not showed up for work. He's not come home. Do you know where he is? Mom doesn't know where he is. Now we're getting concerned. Relatives, the aunt, get involved. Everybody's kind of calling around, Captain, checking local jails, hospitals. What they end up doing is they end up tracking down his white Cadillac. They find that the vehicle was towed. Oh, the way that they're going to trace this thing back is the person that signed off on the tow is an officer Calkins. Well, looky, looky, looky. So now they want to know why the vehicle was towed and where their family member is. So right. they're calling the sheriff's, the Collier County Sheriff's Office and asking, did Calkins drive off with this guy? Our son, our, our family member? They have reason to believe so because by this point, they already know that the vehicle was towed from a cemetery. Right. The family reaches out to that cemetery because, of course, you're going to want to know, why is my relative in the cemetery? Why why was the vehicle towed from there? They speak with a couple of the, the employees of the cemetery who tell them, we witnessed a Collier County Sheriff's car drive off with Terrence in the back. Right. Now, I'm going to jump ahead here just a second, Captain, because I want to go through an incident report that was filed by Officer Calkins. This was just a few days after he picks up Williams. And again, that's in dispute. Okay. And we will see that in this incident report. Calkins report states that he first came in contact with Terrence Williams at 1215 p.m. after noticing that the vehicle and I did some double checking in my notes. It was a 1984 white Cadillac was driving quote in distress. The officer claimed that he followed Terrence to a cemetery parking lot. And then Terrence asked him for a ride to a nearby circle K convenience store because he was running late for work. Okay. A little clarification here. This is not the same circle K that we've previously discussed in the Santos case. Right. However, this is still Collier County and these are not, you know, the distance between this traffic stop and the previous one, not terribly far away from one another. What goes down here is to fill in some of the blanks that are missing from this report here is that Calkin states that Terrence Williams only gives him his first name tells him that he's having trouble with the vehicle and that he's running late for work. He works, according to Calkins. Terrence tells him that he works at that Circle K. 
originally Calkin says, look, I can call a taxi cab for you. I'm not giving you a ride. I can call a cab for you. He says, Williams tells him I can't afford to pay for a cab. So at some point, Calkins agrees to take him to this circle K and he points out to him, Hey, you know, your tags are expired. You've not provided me with any information. And Calkins says that Terrence Williams told him all of the information that the officer was looking for is in the glove box of his vehicle. And after he drops him off at the circle K, I imagine if we're going to believe this story, the way this is going down is Williams tells him this in route to the circle K right? and says, you can go back and you can find all that information inside the vehicle after you drop me off. Yeah. But let's think about this for a second on, is it believable? It makes some sense. I have a DUI. I don't have a license. I'm not legally allowed to drive this vehicle. So if I'm stopped on the side of the road and here comes a police officer, as long as I don't give him my full name, he can't look me up, right? And if I'm not in the vehicle at the time that the officer approaches me, he can't prove that I was driving, right? Right. So all that kind of makes sense. And then you go, well, everybody then says, well, well, look, he didn't work at the Circle K. Well, again, that's another, I'm not going to give you my full name. And by the way, I work down the street at the Circle K. Could you give me a ride? What's at the Circle K? A pay phone or possibly the work phone. The, the story kind of makes sense in the, in the way of somebody not trying to get in trouble for illegally driving. Yeah, and that's what we'll, we'll go through. And I think that you know a lot of people view this and they go, well, this is completely made up. This is all a bunch of BS. And I, I don't think so. I think that there are details in this story that some of them are probably true. And just by making some inferences like you just did, you can see why some of these things might be true here. So continuing on in the incident report filed by Officer Calkins, he says that Williams told him that the paperwork for the vehicle was in the vehicle's glove compartment. And the officer claims that he then returned after dropping Terrence Williams off at the Circle K, that he returned to the Cadillac to discover that the proper registration, the information that he was looking for was not, it was not in fact in the vehicle. And so now he's sitting there going, okay, well this guy lied to me and I fell for it. Right. I was being a nice guy. I gave him a, a lift. I fell for it. So he says at this time that the officer says that he called the circle K from his work issued cell phone. He's got like a next tell that they carry back then. Mind you, this is January, 2004 top of the line. You know, one thing that I always wonder about, let's get sidetracked here for a second. Right. Those next tells remember how they had that walkie talkie feature Yeah. where you could just hit the button. You had like people beep, beep. you could scroll through. You just hit the button and instantly you're communicated with them. Like they don't even have to pick up. It just talks. Right. I thought that was the coolest thing. Somehow we've gone away from that. It's maybe it's an invasion of privacy. So where I think there are some truths here, okay, is one thing that I find interesting is this Circle K that Calkins claims that Williams asked him to drive him to, there is evidence that Williams was a regular at this Circle K, hmm. that he would frequently get gas there, that he okay, would- Okay, because I'm trying to figure out what what is a regular at a gas station. Oh, somebody that gets gas there, somebody maybe- by smokes or by well, dude, anybody that's worked at a gas station will tell you there, there are some people you see every single day. Really? Yeah. You have certain people that will drop in for coffee on their way to work every single day that they work. Mm. Some people that pick up cigarettes on their way home or pick up beer on their way home. There are people that you will see several times a week. And I imagine, you know, Terrence was a smoker and the comments I found was that he purchased gas there regularly. He purchased cigarettes there regularly so that makes some sense i always thought gas station would be an interesting job like you'd see a lot of interesting people and a lot of interesting situations go down 
I worked at gas stations. I enjoyed working there. One thing that I enjoyed was I enjoyed seeing the people regularly, you know, the regulars. Right. You have a very brief interaction with them, and it's usually very pleasant. And uh, so, anyway, the thing here, though, that's that's interesting is Calkins says he calls the Circle K because he's like, all right, this dude tricked me. He asked for Terrence Williams. Calkins says that a female employee, a lady employee, picks up the phone. I think this is important, and we'll get into this in a little bit. But he says that he asked for Terrence Williams. The lady working who answered the phone tells him, I don't know who you're talking about. I don't, there's nobody here. Nobody works here with the name Terrence Williams. Mm. So now he's like, oh, this guy really pulled one over on me. According to the report, Officer Calkins then called in the license plate number and found that the plates were expired. Weird that he didn't run those plates before he gave him a lift. Well, there's a lot of weirdness with this story mm-hmm. so a lot of weirdness with you right he's now back he being the officers back at the cemetery with the vehicle and that's when he calls it in to have the vehicle towed saying that he believes that the vehicle was either abandoned or potentially stolen because it's not registered to terrence williams right it, the, the last person that it was registered to the registration makes makes little sense or no sense, I should say, to me. So I'm sure that giving him the benefit of the doubt here, Calkins probably thought there's a chance that this vehicle could be stolen. We go through that incident report because what we're going to have, Captain, is we're going to have witnesses who tell us something very different, okay? And those witnesses will be the workers at the cemetery. Now, mind you, this is at, noon it's all going down around noon and one o'clock in the afternoon and i i have a question in here that that may not have anything to do with the case but i found myself wondering we have a witness saying that that he left the party at 6 a.m and then we don't have anything with terrence williams until this vehicle situation around noon so we got a missing window of six hours that could potentially be important to this case what we do have here though is if we are to believe any or some of calkin's story is that he decides to give terrence williams a ride he returns to the vehicle and then he has it towed there's a couple problems in here and the cemetery workers will say a couple of things one just like in the previous situation they believe that terrence williams was being placed under arrest They witnessed him being patted down and then placed into the back of the sheriff's vehicle. Right, but sometimes when an officer gives a person a ride, they still pat them down and make sure they have no weapons on them. That's correct. The other issue is that they say that when Officer Calkins came back to the scene, that he now had access to the keys to the vehicle, to the Cadillac. Hmm. And this is because they say that he moved the vehicle, got out of the vehicle, and then threw the keys in the grass. They believe that he moved the vehicle so that he could say that the vehicle was obstructing traffic and therefore it needed to be towed. Later, when questioned, Calkins is going to say that he found the keys inside the vehicle when he returned to the vehicle to find the paperwork and the information that he was looking for that Williams told him he would find there. Well, the problem is we have eyewitnesses from a distance. There's no way they would know when he had the keys or how he came about the keys. All we know is he had them in his possession at some point and the time frame where he has these keys, Terrence Williams is no longer around. He's no longer with the vehicle. Right. Calkins does not say, he never says that he moved the vehicle. In fact, he denies that. However, we have cemetery employee witnesses saying he, in fact, did move the vehicle and then threw the keys away as so that they would not be found. A very odd thing for them to lie about. Well, and to give, right, and I'll give them credibility, one, in the situation that they have no dog in the fight here. They have no reason to make things up. Right. And then take that a step further. One of the employees is retired law enforcement. 
look, if, if he was going to err on the side of protecting his fellow officer, well, we're just getting the truth is what I, what I really believe from these witnesses. Right. The Circle K convenience store where Calkins says that he dropped Terrence Williams off at that day, it's located in the vicinity of Wiggins Pass Road in U.S. 41. Now, both of these Circle Ks are still, they're still standing in an operation today. They are different locations, but I'm giving you the area of this one so that we can determine one thing because we have witnesses that are by the Cadillac that say that they are seeing officer Calkins return to the vehicle anywhere from 15 minutes to one hour later. And this matches up with him calling in the tow as well, because he's calling in the tow. Remember he says he first encountered Terrence Williams at 1215 and then he's calling in the tow at 1257 PM. These are per police records, dispatch records, and such. So that all lines up with what these eyewitnesses are saying. And this Circle K is roughly about a seven-minute drive from the location of the Cadillac at this Naples Memorial Cemetery. But again, there's no video footage of Calkin on the property. That's what's really, really difficult in this situation. Okay, so hard to miss a police car. Well, yes and no. And and that's why I say it's difficult. Most reports, most online reports that you will find will state very clearly that there is no eyewitness having seen Calkins, his vehicle at the Circle K that day, or having seen Terrence Williams at the Circle K that day. We do know because. Mind you, Williams' family, they're actively looking for him within days of him having gone missing. So they're filing a missing persons report, and they're piecing things together. They're the ones that are coming up with the breadcrumb trail to try to lead to their missing loved one. And what they uncover is this interaction with Officer Calkins. So we have Collier County Sheriff's Office. They're going to go to the Circle K. They're going to review surveillance footage that's available to them and to which they never find any indication at all. You know, they don't spot Terrence Williams. They don't spot the officer Calkins either. Now we should point out again, this is a very busy area, middle of the day. There's a chance. I believe there's a chance that either of them or both of them could have been there. Maybe they just weren't picked up on camera for whatever reason. The reason why I say that is because there is one person, there is one employee who has said that they saw both Terrence Williams and Officer Calkins that day at the Circle K. Right. This employee, she says, and I find this to be interesting because remember from the incident report, Officer Calkins says that he called the Circle K and spoke with a female employee. And we have a female eyewitness. Right. This could just be something that's coincidence, what have you. However, it lines up. At the end of the day, it still lines up. Even it's a quinky dinky. A quinky dinky. Yeah. This witness says that she had worked there for a long period of time, and she recognized Terrence Williams as a regular. She didn't know him by name, but recognized him by face as he came in there often for gas and for cigarettes. She says that she saw Terrence Williams fill up a gas can outside. You know, you, you, you walk up and you, you fill up your can and then you make, you know, you make your way out of the place. She says that she believed that he was walking off in the direction of Wiggins pass road. She also said that she spoke with officer Calkins because he came in to the gas station, used the restroom and then asked a question or two about Terrence Williams before leaving. Well, and she remembered how bad it smelled. I don't, this is what's difficult, Captain, because you would think if he went inside and used the restroom and spoke to her inside that he would definitely appear on the surveillance footage. Now, right. I don't know where they're filming and where they're not filming at this location, so it's difficult to tell. We do not have a an extremely detailed report 
from the sheriff's office. Well, and I think the other problem too with these reports is, is it possible that he was seen on, on film, but they didn't collect that evidence because they didn't know that they needed to. From what I've been told in this situation, and um, I believe in the Santos situation as well, is that officers reviewed hours of surveillance footage from both of these Circle Ks. The one thing that we know to be true, okay, there's some question marks in the things we just discussed. But one thing we know to be true that is an absolute lie as far as his incident report goes, the Nextel cell phone that Officer Calkins says that he used to call the Circle K to verify if Terrence Williams worked there or was still there, we know that that is a lie because that cell phone is owned by the Sheriff's Department. They're trying to back up his story. They look it up. There's no call in their records from that cell phone to the Circle K. And in his incident report, he's very specific about this. He says, I used my Nextel sheriff's office phone to call the Circle K, and I had the Circle K's number because I keep a phone book in the patrol car with me. Mm Mm-hmm. That's very specific, detailed information to which the sheriff's office can 100% say that's false. We can tell by the records you did not use that phone to call the Circle K. So now we are left with the big question, lots of questions. And at the top of that list is what, in fact, really did happen that day and where the hell are these two missing men? And not only are they missing, but they're endangered missing. Terrence Williams is described as African American, 5 feet 8 inches tall, 160 to 170 pounds, with brown eyes and brown hair. He has several tattoos, a T, the letter T above his left chest, ET, on his right shoulder and Terrence in red with blue highlights on his left forearm. He also has a gold crown with the letter T on the upper right tooth and the other upper front tooth is solid gold. So some very distinctive marks and identifiers on Terrence. He also has a vertical scar on his right shoulder and a dark birthmark on the right side of his abdomen. He was last seen wearing a short sleeve shirt, blue jeans, and brown Timberland boots. He was also wearing diamond earrings and a watch with a silver band. The face of the watch was surrounded by white stones. If anybody has any information in either case, please contact Crime Stoppers at 1 800 780 8477. So much more to get to tomorrow in the garage. Make sure you join us. Make sure you share this case on social media. It needs your help. It needs our help. It needs a good spotlight. That's right, Captain. Everybody, get back here in the garage tomorrow. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.